Thank you, Nicholas. I would like now, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, my friend Ted Roosevelt Malloch, who comes from the United States. He is a member of the Zermatt Summit Board. He has spent a big part of his career in the public sector, in the, pu in the private sector, in Wall Street. He's also a writer and many, many other things. A warm welcome to you, Ted. And he will be moderating this session, the Dare to Care. Thank you, Christopher. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. So can I invite my fellow panelists to the designated seats? I know you're in the audience. I saw you this morning, so don't be shy. So we have an introduction. Can we have the film for just a few minutes? Courage means the mental or moral strength to venture, to withstand danger and difficulty. Courage is progressively more necessary as life matures. Today in the heart of Oklahoma, giant rigs like this one continue to churn out vital natural resources to support the oil and gas industry. Much of the technology it takes to keep many of the big rigs operating is due to a number of innovations from a brilliant engineering mind from Oklahoma City. The engineer was Garmin Kimmel, the founder of Kimray Incorporated, one of the nation's leading manufacturers of control valves energy exchange pumps, and other control devices for the world's oil and gas industry. From the very beginning, he valued trust. He valued relationships. And relationships drove uh, how he did business. If you want to have a good relationship, you have to have good character because it's based upon trust. It's based upon integrity. And that's what character is all about. Kimmel had a passion and a talent for creative engineering on the factory floor and in relationships with customers and staff. We want our customers to have a fantastic experience when they deal with our people. We have customers who will come visit our company even when they don't need to buy anything. They just come here in order to be encouraged because our employees are encouraging to them. Son-in-law Thomas Hill and his two sons have continued to run the billion-dollar family business by employing a hiring practice Garmin dared to implement when the company was founded in 1948. A practice in which employees are hired not only on their skill set, but also on their character. If you don't make a profit, you don't stay in business. But we believe that um, success both individual success and corporate success is driven by good character or integrity, uh, virtue. The family's corporate management philosophy is rooted in courage, the courage to forego short-term gains in order to invest in long-term possibilities, and the courage to place character before profit. Our desire to make our our employees successful, our desire to make the community that we're in successful, and our desire to make our customers successful is genuine. Kim Ray has developed a bold initiative called Character First, in which staff members measure their success based on specific character criteria, as well as skills and achievements. We tell our customers right up front what our value system is. We tell the board of directors what we're trying to accomplish both from a corporate standpoint as far as expanding the company's business, but also having a greater impact for good in our community. Discipline refers to teaching and learning. This is what molds and perfects the mental faculties of moral. Thank you. The film goes on. We won't watch the whole film. <laughs> Carriage, 
I looked up the definition again this morning. Courage is the quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger, pain, without fear, with bravery. In the obsolete definition is the heart, the source of emotion. Idiomatically, it means to have the courage of one's convictions to act in accordance with one's beliefs, especially in spite of criticism. So we have some rules for our panel this morning. We have a good bit of time, but I think we'll have an ordered and highly interactive conversation that will also include you eventually. So prepare your questions now. We have, on a first-name basis, the good fortune to have four very different, yet very similar people. When we hear from them, I think you'll be surprised. I'm not going to read their bios, because you have this wonderful booklet, and you can do that yourself. I will tell you in one sentence, however, something very deeply personal about each one of them that you don't know, that I made them confess to me. <laughs> Hubert, on my right, is a father of six, two of whom are adopted, and is one of the great hunters in the world, but he prefers to shoot clay pigeons. <laughs> Melchior, here on my left, is uh, very involved in the uh, uh, rescue missions uh, as a Swiss, uh, but he is, uh, I think, four or five generations from a family of academics. His father was a philosopher. He always wanted to be a philosopher, therefore he's very frustrated because he actually has a full-time job, but he has a, a great accomplishment in the field of horse jumping. So if you're interested in that subject, Juan, all the way to my left, coming from Chile, his father of five, he confessed to me last night over a four-hour dinner of fondue, so I got him to tell me all of his secrets, actually, that um, he learns more from the family dynamics of his family than from any textbook, from any PowerPoint, slideshow, or even from my own books. So <laughs> we'll hear about that. And then finally, from South Korea via the United States, uh, Jim Young. Uh, recently married for a few years to a brave captain, soon to be major in the U.S. Marines, also very, in, very involved in Falls Church uh, in, uh, in Virginia, a very big part of her spiritual center. So there you have our four friends on a first name basis. What I'd like to ask them to do in the first five minutes or so, and I am, I think you know, a, a policeman of this. Um, and I, I, maybe I should say about myself, I am now uh, presently a visiting professor at Tübingen University at the world famous World Ethics Center, where I'm writing a, yet another new book on prudence and prudent behavior in business, which will also have a number of very practical tools a virtue matrix, an ethics audit, a sustainability audit, a governance audit, and an enterprise risk management protocol to help companies do exactly that. So something about myself. But what we like to do in the first five minutes for each is have them give us, frankly, their personal testimony about their personal values. What motivates each one of you personally? What is the coherence between your values and what you actually do? What is your concern for the human person what is your ultimate reference, your guiding star, star so to speak, your, your source of wisdom, or what I call your spiritual capital, not only for yourself, but also for your work? In other words, at the very beginning, I want you to spill your guts. <laughs> and we'll start with you. Well, it's a, it's a real uh, challenge to, to be the first to start, and a real privilege to be here. Um, I want first to thank my brother Christian um, uh, to introduce me to Thomas and to, to have the chance to, to be here, to this place. Um, well, my, my, uh, my deep feeling, well, because you, you asked the question straight, right? Um, my, my, my gut is that um, since, I would say since I am 18 years old, I feel uh, really beloved by God. Uh, this has been a, a personal experience 
that has driven all my life. Um, I studied business. At that time, I had a key question, which was, what is the sense of studying business when I am beloved by God? Um, I had the chance to, uh, to study at New York University, and there, I, I, in New York, I, uh, I discovered the gap between uh, uh, rich, uh, richness and poverty, and I had the chance to meet Mother Teresa, who opened me uh, a way to, to think that well, I was not a medicine doctor to help poor people in, uh, in Africa, but as businessman, I could also serve uh, others. And this is why um, I, um, I felt the, the possibility, why I find the possibility to, to go to Chile, uh, to work in the development bank, and then with France, with some of them are here, with Anne, you see here, uh, we, we started a microfinance bank uh, to, to help poor micro, uh, no, not, not so poor, but micro entrepreneurs to develop their business at a time where it was almost impossible for them to, to, get, grant, to get loans from banks. And, and my search in life has been to, 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 to try to, to, do, uh, to, to do business in unity with my, uh, my uh, spirituality, with my, my faith. Um, shall I say what I'm doing today now? So today it's 30 years later. Um, I am the CEO, chairman and CEO of a Mittelstein French company, I would say, which name is Armor. Uh, it has become the number one, the le leading company in the world to produce um, uh, printing ribbons uh, for uh, barcode labels. So when you buy your, 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 your salad or your salmon in supermarket, so you, have, uh, you, you, you get uh, uh, to give your blood and, uh, and you have a label with barcode on it. Or in your in your cell phone, you have a barcode. You you can know that one out of two in Europe and one out of three in the world is printed by a small company called Armor, uh, which turnover is only 300 million euro. Uh, we um, we are 2,000 people there, um, so it's a real industrial company. It's a normal company. It's not an exceptional company. It's a I say a company like there are many others. Um, what has been important for me is that I, I was recruited to, to lead this company 10 years ago. It's almost 10 years now. The company was not in so much in a good shape. The shareholders had many questions. They wanted to sell it. Uh, the results were not good. There was many social tensions. Um, the only articles in the press of, of this company were when they were uh, pneumatic holes fired uh, in front of, of the plant. So it was, it was quite tough. Um, they were one, one activity was all right, the other one was real, uh, losing an, en an enormous amount of money. Uh, this activity, losing money, was employing 1,000 people. And I remember very well when I came, I, I met many people, many financial people also, who tell me, well, it's Hubert uh, or Mr. De Buono, it's very simple what you have to do. You just cut this activity and you will see your results like that. And I, could, I knew it would be feasible, I knew it would be maybe the easiest to do, but um, it, it came to me like that to tell them, well, you're, you're certainly right, but there is only one problem. Of course, I said that back, my, back, back by my shareholders also that I had convinced before. But I said, there is only one problem, is that I didn't come for that. I didn't come for that. I come to, to resurrect this, this, uh, this activity to to, to, uh, to, uh, to make it become a success, not to erase it. And we made a big decision, which was to um, put uh, sustainable development, corporate social responsibility at the heart of the strategy of the company. <coughs> and at that time, nobody believed what it could mean. It was not greenwashing. It was really trying to, 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 to put human, the, the, the person and the uh, uh, environment at the heart of the strategy. We decided that 100% of our printing cartridges for laser printing cartridges for cooperation would be remanufactured, uh, and we changed many things. In year 2000, this was in 2008, difficult year, you remember. In 2009, it was in France, and uh, I think not only in France, but a very difficult year economical, um, regarding the economy, and the, you know it was a crisis. Um, this activity was suffering, but the, the growth of the, of the activity was, has been 40%. Just after stating that we would put 
and we would change so many things, putting uh, sus um, uh, sustainable development at the heart of the, of the, of the um. And then we save the 1,000 jobs, and today they are still there, and we, we are developing. Um, this was one thing. Second thing, the other activity that was better, that was going better, at we, um, there has been no investment made in the last three years, and I told the shareholders, well, uh, you need to invest. They accepted to invest 50 million euro um, very quickly in um, uh, robotization and so on. But the challenge was not to to um, not, not to to decrease the number of jobs due to robotization. So I told them also, robotization, you know, in front the the the, the, the cost of salary is very high. Uh, so we needed robotization. But I told them we need to do that. At the same time, we need to search growth where it is. So we decided to develop the, the company in emerging countries in a kind of what we call a co-industrialization program, which means that we produce the semi-finished goods in France and we finish them near, close to the customer, to, to be able to serve our customer in three days, wherever they are in the world. And thanks to that, we multiply by three our production in 10 years, keeping the number of jobs. We raise the level of the, of the workers from being operators to pilots of robotized machines. And to do that, we created a university inside the company. So we have Univers Armour University, which gives um, diplomas recognized by the state, like, uh, you know, uh, in, um, and, and the, the, the workers have, been, have seen their job enhanced due to that. Uh, third thing we did is that we, we wanted to welcome fragility and, um, and um, mainly handicapped persons in the company. Today we have more than 60 handicapped persons in the company. And we specialize ourselves in uh, deaf and mute people. Um, and we have five persons, you know, uh, being trained in the language of deaf and mute. And this is incredible how the integration of more fragile or weak persons is changing the spirit of the way of working together. This is one thing that is important to us. And the last but not least, um, last year our shareholders, uh, you know, the, the family that was owning the company had sold the shares to an investment fund. And I was very worried about what would happen after this investment fund would sell the shares because most investment funds are very short term minded. And uh, um, I was afraid of what would happen after, and I was afraid that all that what all, all what we created could disappear in very quickly because the view, vision of the company would be different. And we decided uh, with the uh, managers associating all employees to take the majority of the capital of the company. So we did that last year, on, well, let's say last last April, uh, which was a tremendous challenge, a little bit like uh, totally crazy, mm -hmm. but. We wanted to, to master the long-term visibility in our industrial project. So we are, we are in it now, Very trying exciting. to associate all the, all the managers. And there is a, what I can test him, uh, what I can say that the, the enthusiasm within the company is very big, despite the difficult economical situation. There is a, a concurrent spirit and a humani humanism spirit, you know, which is uh, um, very present. Uh, thank you. Let's turn to the far left here and ask Juan the same question. Tell us your story. <coughs> Which one? This one or the other one? Okay, whatever. So hello, good morning. I'm uh, very honored to be here with you. Uh, I'm a regular guy, honestly. Um, I, I'm part of, uh, speaking of who I am, basically, I'm part of a family that has been living in Chile for 300 years. We have produced uh, presidents of the country, judges, diplomats. We have been farming land forever. From that, I learned a big sense of responsibility. Uh, I'm part of a family of seven brothers and sisters. And from there, I learned the importance of uh, hearing to people. Uh, I have a wonderful mother, a very loving one, and I learn about love and caring. My father, a judge of the Supreme Court in Chile, uh, taught me about the thirst of justice. Uh, I live in Santiago, in Leuven, in Paris, in Vancouver, Canada, so I learned 
the richness of diversity. Um, by visiting my brother, my, my, sorry, my uncle, the Catholic priest, I learned all the richness of poverty. Uh, from so many right people I've met in my life, I've learned humbleness. One of them is here, you know, my, my business partner, Chris Hermanson from Canada. And from my wife, I met her 14 years ago. I, uh, I've learned the power of love that is so powerful that, that has given us five children. And that's me, that's, this makes who I am. And this makes the main capital of the company I founded 10 years ago, Teco. Teco is a Chilean company. We are 45 people. Uh, many of them are indigenous people. And uh, we are three partners. A Canadian, who is here. A matam he's a mathematician. An indigenous engineer, an indigenous Mapuche, the indigenous people, the main indigenous culture in Chile is Mapuche, and myself. And we share the diagnosis about our country, our beloved country. Chile is a wonderful country. We have been working so hard lately to, to, to make people have new opportunities. We have been vacuuming people from poverty like crazy. We're an example around the world. We're doing good, but we also face big challenges. And I would say that the main challenge is that there, the country is being, uh, is being provided opportunities for not all of us. Soteco has been created to help fix that. So the vision of our company I, I think it's a very powerful one. It's that we work intensively and originally to create a new Chile, abundant, sustainable to all Chileans. We work with investors, mining, forest, in forestry, in energy, in infrastructure. And, and what happens is that most of these investors, they have, uh, I would say, a project first mentality they put all their energies designing wonderful projects with the hope that beyond doing a good business, they will create good for the people. But it seems that the project comes first. So basically what we do is that we help them turn their projects into trickle up development. So how we do that? making this project to coexist harmoniously with the communities around. What we do basically is to bring all what I talked before, caring, loving, empathy, compassion, and we make those two parties, investors and community, to sit together, to get to know each other, to respect each other, and at some point, eventually, to be partners. So based on this very simple but powerful approach, we have been able to unlock, I would say, 1,500 megawatts of energy in our country. We have been able to unlock new roads, new sustainable mining projects for the country, projects that we need, that we were stuck by the opposition of people. Mm -hmm. So to wrap up, uh, basically, uh, when I had this dream 10 years ago, it seemed a bit crazy to make a life of this. But now we, are, we have become, a, I would say, a fairly prosperous business. Uh, we have become very well known in Chile. Uh, everybody's talking about us, basically. And, uh, and when I'm being asked about the, basically the formula for the business, I would say that is that when I go to the office every day, when I sit in my office, the guy that's sitting there is exactly the same guy that said hello to my wife and my kids at home, kissed them, and went to work. I'm not a different person. 
So when we started the company, I didn't have a penny, but I just have these huge assets, all what I learned throughout my life. That's my story. Thank you. I'm going to stay on this side with Melchior and ask you to take your turn. Thank you very much. So um, I understand uh, we need to be very personal. And this morning, I, after a short night, um, I was wondering how to start. And I, I fall to Father uh, Nicolas Butet, who I know a, a little bit. I met him uh, several times. And he still inspires me. Uh, I could say every day, in fact. <laughs> you don't know that, but uh, I tell you. <laughs> so. Um, and he told me, I will be your back office and you will find the inspiration. And I in fact, I, I did find it. Um, as, I t uh, as I tell you, uh, I'm belonging to a, a family of uh, university professor. My father was a university professor in uh, uh, medieval philosophy, a specialist of Saint Thomas d'Aquin, quite a theologian, if you want. My grandfather used to be a historian professor in Basel. My grand-grandfather, Gonzague de Reynold, was known as the right conservative Catholic uh, uh, historian, if you may say so. He taught me when I was very young uh, Swiss history. So when I was a teenager, I, I, I was very lucky to belong to that family. Of course, it was very rich, but I needed to contradict a little bit all those savvy people, you know, about, uh, you know. And I read a book, uh, you surely read, uh, read it as well, but which really inspires me. It means I think at my... Uh, personal, uh, professional venture, I think it inspired me a lot, which is the chapter of the brother Karamazov, the great inquisitor. Very, sh very shortly, uh, Jesus Christ coming back at the age of the inquisition in Sevilla. And uh, he resuscitated a, a young girl during a funeral, and the great inquisitor recognized him and arrested him, of course. And at three o'clock in the morning, he came to Jesus Christ's jail, opened the door and says, why, is, is that you? Is that you? Why did you come back? And Jesus Christ is, was still sitting on his uh, wood bed, and he says, you know, the freedom you propose us is too heavy for us, for us human beings. You know that. That's why they gave it back to me. And you will have the proof to the, tomorrow morning when I will ask these precise people who did recognize you when you arrive in the city, to light up the fire where you will die. And then he stops, a bit afraid, having say uh, such uh, strong things in front of uh, his boss at the end. Huh? And Jesus Christ, still smiling, uh, get up, walk to the great inquisitor and kiss him on his lips. And the great inquisitor, completely shocked, uh, opened the door of the jail and says, go away, go away and never come back. You know, you, you, you know that story. And, and so that really inspired me about the, the idea of, of freedom. And I had a very good way to argue with my father on the, you know, authoritarian scholastics uh, and uh, the, you know, infiability of the Pope and things like that. Uh, for a teenager, it was very inspiring. And, uh, and, and, and so, so uh, uh, and as you said, being uh, bred into an academic family, I wanted to become a professor because I thought it was a good way to combine it with my passion of uh, breeding horses, because I saw my father teaching only two hours a week. Yes. Huh? Uh, <laughs> but working a lot at home, huh? but yeah. working a lot at home, so I thought, that's, that's for me. And I tried to make a PhD in political science and to complete my PhD, and that was an accident, but a fortunate accident, and because it's a heavy task, you know, you have to write hundreds of uh, pages, um, uh, so uh, I had to find a job and uh, I started uh, to work at Lombardier uh, as a trainee, knowing anything about finance. Uh, I started in the back office and I started uh, in financial analysis and so on and so forth during two years. And it was a, a great experiment and uh, at the end, I decided to stay there, but uh, a little bit by accident, huh? uh, maybe as well by laziness, because I realized, in fact, that at that time, at least, it was much easier to work in finance than to make the <laughs> academical uh, career. True confession. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, but the, the, the luck I had was that I really understood 
uh, in doing that training program, instead of uh, st having studying HSC, I really understood the, 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 the reality of the, of the business and the back office, the, 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 the field visit of companies, uh, the, the, the whole you know, box of, uh, of uh, asset management. But with another point of view, and at the end, I was uh, managing in the 90s, I man was managing big pension fund portfolio, very big, hundreds of millions, uh, half a billion portfolios. Uh, and I realized that, in fact, these savings belonging to the people, nurses, uh, 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 policemen, farmers, uh, etc., were silent. And that the, the one who, 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 who controlled that, the uh, asset gatherer, the banks, uh, the asset manager, uh, were in fact freezing the free expression of uh, the, the real share, uh, shareholders and uh, asset owners, which in fact are the people. And that's how, in discussion with several of, our, of my clients, we launched uh, the ETHOS Foundation and Swiss Investment Foundation, which was the first activist fund in Switzerland. And that created a wave, in fact. Uh, some companies, I don't, will not give you some names, but came to the bank saying, you should have to kill ETHOS, because it's not the point, and they don't have to vote. You know how to vote, and you know that banks, in fact, are never voting the share. They're always voting the share with the board, you know, in order to keep good relation. You never know, you can have a credit line, you can have a portfolio management uh, business with them, so don't bother them, it, let's freeze the free expression of, uh, of uh, the base uh, of shareholder. And then, uh, and, and I, will do, I will be short, uh, but just two, two other stories. Then I left uh, Lombardier to launch uh, a dream for me, uh, which is Blue Orchard Finance, which is an investment company investing in microfinance. Uh, uh, and, uh, as well, the same spirit of somehow of, of freedom saying, okay, poor are not poor because uh, they are lazy, they are poor because they don't have access, free access to capital. And, and that's how we, we started the operation. As an example, just to keep on this line, uh, because we could come back on that, uh, the, the free expression of the people uh, at the base of the capital market. The success of Biorstadt started when the nurses of the pension fund, hospital pension fund for Geneva asked the board, because you know in Switzerland pension funds are um, controlled, governed by the employees on one side and the employers on the other side. So the employees have a voice huh, in, in the Swiss uh, system. And the nurses says we would like to have part of our savings in microfinance. And that's how they came to me. And they put 70% in our fund, mm -hmm. much, much more than uh, usual. Right? They, they always control that, saying, okay, we'll do it. We give you a chance and you will catch up and we will be, become a minority shareholder of the fund. But we would like you to, to, to do that. And I was very impressed to see that small nurses having very small retirement, but having a voice, ask for that, you know, an inclusive uh, financial products which could include the woman, entrepreneur woman at the, at the base of the pyramid, creating a solidarity. Uh, so, uh, and then the last and the most important venture for me, I made it with Regis Burry, sorry, who's here uh, in the room, uh, which is the Gilet uh, Engagement Fund, which is a family of funds who are trying to engage in the name of the shareholders and the end of the people representing those uh, pension fund and uh, or, or individual shareholders trying to engage and to put a face in front of the big multinational in engaging within a shareholder dialogue around the uh, ESG classical issues, but alongside the 10 principles of the Global Compact. I know that Armour Group is a signatory of the Global Compact, so we could exchange on that. Trying really to, to, to link up the base of the people uh, savings to the governance of the companies, because I really believe that in freeing that, we could uh, help companies uh, grasping into their value chains, the sustainable, sustainable development goals, and uh, a more long-term approach. So that's, uh, in a nut nutshell, that's my, my Thank story. You. So now I turn to my other side, and of course the, the last is always the first. So tell us your story at Bitcoin and your own personal journey. Well, um, first of all, I want to say that I'm very, very impressed to see so many women in the room. I think in every industry, there aren't enough women at the very top tiers of leadership. And I, I think there's like a 50-50 split here, which is very, very impressive. So thank you for being a part of this. Um, 
Um, so as Ted mentioned, I am South Korean by, by birth, um, though my parents were the first ones to immigrate to the United States individually in the 70s. My mother to pursue a master's in theology and my father, um, he came with his family and joined the U.S. Army. He was an enlisted soldier. And they actually met in the U.S. And I was supposed to be born in Texas, but the Army sent my family back to Korea. So I was born in Korea instead. And so whether or not I'm a U.S. citizen by birth, I'm still trying to figure that out. And every immigration office I've talked to don't know because my situation is so unique. So I'm still, still trying to figure that out. So you could still be president? Maybe. <laughs> but we will see. <laughs> um, so I don't know um, how familiar you are with the Korean culture, um, but my father, you know, he was very authoritative because it's a very patriarchal culture. But on top of that, he was also military. So he's like very authoritative. Um, and my whole life, he said, you have to have a five year plan. So it was drilled into me early on. I have all these little notebooks where I would every day make a little schedule for myself because I had to have a plan for my life. Um, when I was in college, you know, I was living my plan for my life. You know, I'd gotten myself to school. Um, my father was an enlisted soldier, so we didn't have that much money. So I had to apply for scholarships and get college paid for by working full time. And I, I was having a little meltdown. <laughs> I was working full time as a freshman in college, um, trying to stay in school by paying for it. But because I was working full time, I wasn't doing very well in school. And so it was, it was this very, um, it was like a rat race and it felt like a catch 22. And halfway through college, I, I did have a little meltdown because I thought, this is too hard. Like it is too hard to try to financially sustain yourself um, and yet still be educated. And when you don't come from a, a affluent social economic background, how, how does one who doesn't have that sort of background or connections rise above a poverty level or rise above and do better than how your immigrant parents have done. Um, and it was in the middle of college that I encountered Jesus. And it was in my weakest moment where I thought, you know, there's gotta be more to life than just going to school, working a job and having a family. You know, in every Korean family, you're taught go to school, get a job, and have a family. And that, that purpose in life um, was, for me, Jesus, encountering a living God who um, I could have a conversation with, who I could talk about my future and the purpose of my life and why I was you know, placed on earth at this time. Um, so in this exploration of trying to understand who Jesus is and my purpose in life, uh, one of my friends and mentors challenged me. She said, you know, when you graduate from college, instead of pursuing your five-year plan, what if you just asked Jesus what to do with their life? And that really caught me off guard because I didn't expect Jesus to answer. I thought, I have a plan. God gave us a brain, so I'm going to use it. But she was, what she was doing was she was challenging me to submit my heart where I should use my brain. I should use the wisdom and the intellect that the Lord gave me. But at the same time, my heart should be submitted and it should be living out of a place of faith and not fear. So that everything I did didn't stem from or didn't stem from being afraid, but stemmed from having faith that there was someone um, bigger than me and that I was not God who was in control of my life. So I did, and that decision led me to Mozambique. Um, I never was one of those people that wanted to live in Africa. Never one of those people that wanted to um, really dedicate myself to working with the poor in a country, in a language that was not my own. Um, but when I asked the Lord what I should do with my life, he said, you should go to Africa, or Mozambique specifically. And this was my senior year of college, and you know my parents, they're Korean, so they're like, what are you gonna do? Where are you gonna work? Mm -hmm. And I told them, well, so I have these three options. Um, I feel like God is saying I'm not supposed to go to work after college, but I'm going, that I'm supposed to go to Mozambique, but I have these other opportunities, a research opportunity in Argentina, 
or a medical um, opportunity in North Korea, what do you think? And my parents, um, I think what surprised me the most is they actually said, you know, we just feel like Mozambique is where you're supposed to be. They didn't even balk at the fact that I didn't have a job and I had no plans to get a job. Um, and so I just said, okay, God, if you want me to go to Mozambique, you're gonna have to pay for it because I don't have a job because someone told me not to get a job. And um, this young woman that I had met during my senior year called me during that summer and said, someone just gave me $3,000 and said that I know someone who's supposed to be in Mozambique this fall. Are you supposed to be in Mozambique this fall? And I said, how did you know? Um, and she said she had also prayed and the Lord had told her that it was most likely me. And so I just thought that was like the craziest thing I've ever heard. And then I thought, well, if there was ever a time in my life where I could be a fool for Christ, where I could, where I didn't have a mortgage, I wasn't married, um, I didn't have a job, that I could just do something that sounded a little crazy, this was it. Um, and so that was my leap of faith. And since then, um, I've lived and worked in Mozambique, as my bio mentioned. I've been recruited to work in Congress. I've worked on national political campaigns um, for some of the highest ranking um, political office holders in this generation. Um, and now I work for the hottest innovative technology mm -hmm. that Silicon Valley is going crazy over called Bitcoin. And I wanted to say that, you know, I don't share this to impress you, um, but I have not applied for one job since I graduated from college. Every opportunity that I've had um, has been a result of word of mouth. Someone heard about me, um, my work ethic, my reputation, and they wanted to bring me onto their team. And so it was very character-based, as your film mentioned. But I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you that you know every decision that I've made was rooted in that early um, formation of living out of faith and not fear. And believing that my life has a greater purpose than just going to work and earning a paycheck. But it's, it's to, you know, my, my father said when I was younger, don't, don't chase money, but let money chase you. And my, my father's Korean and his English is not perfect. So what he meant by that was do what you love, pursue what you love, and everything else will take care of itself. And I decided early on the one thing that I love the most is Jesus. And what Jesus loves the most is the poor. And as a result, everything that I've done has been trying to understand what are the best ways to empower the poor to break free from the cycle of poverty. And I hope that throughout this session, we'll be able to talk about some of those policies and some of those um, activities. So thank well, you for well, having thank, me. Thank you for these introductions. Now we know the panel. We know them deeply, probably more deeply than they've ever confessed in public before. Uh, and I want to focus in the next iteration, in the next round of this in, uh, interactive panel, on the common good. And specifically, we want to focus on this virtue, which we've already identified, the virtue of courage. We want to ask them about their concern for the human person and for this very wonderful slogan, humanizing globalization. So I want each of them, and we'll go right down the line here, to tell us one episode, very briefly, a profile in courage. You know the term, a profile in courage. Where did you encounter courage? And you've already given us some indications already in your personal testimonies, but in your recent business life, what has demanded that kind of courage? It's a big disadvantage to, to, to start because, but, but um, <laughs> no, I think courage, where I experience courage, I think through the, the examples I told you, uh, there have been several, uh, several moments. Um, I remember when I, uh, when I, st I stood up saying, well, uh, we won't erase the poor activity and erasing uh, 1,000 jobs, we will find another way. Um, I didn't have all the solutions at the time, but I think what was really uh, motivating me is uh, the deep conviction that um, the, econ the, the economy you know, is not only uh, figures, it's not only 
uh, is not only money. It's it's also human beings. It's also and what pushed me to to fight to keep this activity and to find another way was listening to people uh, in the in the workshops telling me, you know, we will fight to save our business, and you can count on us. Um, and what has been impressive is that you know. At that time, we were producing uh, already remanufacturing cartridges, but there was a kind of belief that doing recycled product was less good than, going, than, than doing new products. And I, so on one side there was that, on the other side, uh, there, there were all this, this um, brainstorming on how we will fight uh, you know uh, the uh, problem of climate and, uh, and the, 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 um, the, um, the lacking of uh, natural resources and so on. And I said, well, we, we, are, we, are, we are excusing ourselves to, to, to be able to make recycling cartridges which quality is as good as the new ones. Uh, and at the same time, there is a huge problem because only, only the printing cartridges that are, that are uh, um, wasted every year is equivalent to, for the laser cartridges, for instance, is 100,000 tons of materials in Europe that are just uh, incinerated, you know, or, 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 put, or, or, or putting in the waste. So it's a huge challenge. And they were saying, we are excusing ourselves to do the job of recycling this material. And so the thinking was, but why cannot we reverse the situation? And saying that what we are doing is extraordinary. We are saving one, we contribute to save, we don't, we don't succeed yet to save 1,000 tons, but at least we save 2,000 tons every year by ourselves of materials by, you know. And, and having the courage to say these things uh, created a change. And, you know, today in France, two-thirds of the banks are buying our printing cartridges, which are remanufactured. And they are proud of it because it serves their own commitment to corporate social responsibility. And it's going in the sense of uh, global compact and so on and so on. So, so this is um, where I saw the link between, you know, uh, economy, um, humanizing globalization, saving jobs, and doing something we are proud of. And I think the success of today is certainly linked to, to that. Um, another moment is a recent one when, uh, when uh, the question about the capital, the evolution of the capital of the company. Well, I met many, many investment funds in a short time. Um, and a part of them, when they were meeting me, they were beginning to say, well, we were first, be before discussing your project, we want to answer something. We want short-term liquidity. Mm -hmm. So we want to discuss with you the conditions at which we are sure that in five years' time we will get back our money and we are sure that if you don't sell the company, we'll be able to sell it at... Uh, uh, by ourselves instead of you, to make sure that in five years' time, whatever happens, the company will be sold. And many times I was saying, well, but we are not trying to, to buy back the majority of the capital for that. The reason is to build an industrial project, an innovation project, a, people, a project based on long-term vision. And I saw such a gap between some, I don't say all, but some, vision of, of, um, of capital, capitalism and the need of a long-term industrial project. You know, we, we are investing in new projects for the future, maybe we'll talk uh, after, but uh, and we, we, need it, we need at least 10, 15 years visibility, not five, you know? And <laughs> it requires some courage, some time to tell them, well, uh, I'm sorry, but we are not at all in line in terms of vision. Uh, your project is not ours. Mm. So we don't need your money. We are sorry. Very brave. And they were telling me, but, it's, but I, we, we don't understand. <laughs> what we ask is a market. Is a, is, this is a market. And, and I told them, well, but what we, we bear inside is not the market. It's our company. And you will, not, you will not translate your own constraints to us. Hmm? It's not because your investors want the money in five years that you will force us to have a five years vision and, and you, tomorrow you will tell me that we cannot invest in long-term innovation project because it will not, the interest rate of return will not be as good. Because at the same time they were telling me if the inter interest rate of return is not 20% per year, we're not interested. So, so 
so this is where I, I could experience the risk to not to have the project succeed to buy back the capital because I couldn't find the, 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 the support, but I prefer to, to be faithful to our project. And at the end, I think we succeeded to find some who are in line. Junyong, profile and carriage. Um, mine's, my story is a little bit different in that, you know, the Bitcoin Foundation that I represent, we're not a business, we're a foundation. Um, and Bitcoin itself is an instrument that is courageous in that what it seeks to do is innovate um, a financial service system that is very well established. Now there's some perception out there that maybe, well, maybe Bitcoin can replace the central bank. Bitcoin is not going to replace the central bank. Um, Bitcoin, if anything, is a technological platform that enables you to transfer value over the internet. Now, if you think about that, you think, well, we already do that. We have credit cards. Credit cards um, don't transfer value over the internet. They utilize third-party systems like banks and credit card companies in order to transfer your funds. But what Bitcoin is, it's the cryptography, it's the code that now you can literally transfer value over the internet without a third party. Um, and why is that courageous? Um, living in, in Mozambique and then also having been to India, what a lot of people don't realize is you know, there are billions of people around the world that are unbanked. They have no access to financial services. They have no way of saving money, of receiving money efficiently. Um, there are some people who have families in third world countries. They can't send them money without having to pay anywhere from 8 to 15% in, remit in remit remittance fees and you know, one to three days, depending on what country and uh, how much you're willing to pay. Um, and 8 to 15% to someone, let's say, in Mexico or the Philippines, that's a lot of money. Maybe that's not so much for us, but it's a lot of money. Um, and so what Bitcoin seeks to do as a technological platform in the, world, in the future of mobile banking and mobile payments, which is rapidly, rapidly expanding, is to provide um, that tech platform. And a lot of um, existing companies like Visa, MasterCard, they, for years, a lot of people don't know, have been investing money in their research and development to invent this exact platform the creator of Bitcoin beat them to the punch. And so what we are trying to challenge as the Bitcoin Foundation is, um, as a company, do you, do you want to privatize this so that you can earn the maximum profit? Or are you willing to adopt an open source protocol because it already exists so that you can further in, um, advance global financial inclusion faster? And maybe the company doesn't earn as much money, maybe it doesn't earn as much or add as much to their bottom line, but for the sake of getting more people connected to a global financial system, are you willing to adopt this new technology? So turning to the other side, Melchior, tell us a story in courage. A story of courage. So um, I could be, in fact, uh, managing pension fund, family office, portfolio in a big bank still. And I decided to join a small company and to venture jointly with Regis and Doris Rocha, who's the, the managing director of the Gillet Foundation, a family of en shareholder engagement funds. It's a fascinating story, but uh, I believe some, every day we need to find courage to continue because, in fact, uh, as, I, uh, as I told you, the, the the capital market is a li little bit mastered by a great inquisitor, you know. The, nobody wants to move, and why so? Why, why to go so far ahead? We knew, we knew that uh, in socially responsible investment we had the best in class, that's enough, you know. Why do you engage? Why, why do you try to, to really be an active shareholder engaging uh, uh, along those 10 principles? Uh, on the, I would say, just to, to sum up a bit our, our common experience, uh, I think on the company side, we have a great access, and we are very welcome. They, they even some, sometimes wait on us, because there are very few shareholders able to challenge them on their corporate social responsibility consistently. Uh, I don't want to go to the methodology and so on, but we have uh, made, uh, developed it jointly with the Global Compact Office in New York. So we really have a legitimacy, and companies are welcoming us, I see. 
Matthews Kilgariff here from Richemont. He will not contradict, contradict me. Uh, I think we are giving them a lot of value. But on the other side, when you go to the capital market, uh, gatekeepers, which are the big insurances, uh, the big banks, uh, the big um, uh, pension funds, in fact, why to move, you know? And each time we have to find the, the, the resources to convince them that what we are doing is for their own freedom of expressing the will of the people. And if we don't do that, capitalism will fail. Well, I have very tense discussion. My, my, my children are teenager now, uh, and they are a bit like me. When I was a teenager, they are contradict yeah. contradicting yeah. me every day, <laughs> saying that I'm a, a new Goldman Sachs of microfinance and of, uh, you know, so <laughs> it's very tense. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I try to convince them, and at least I think they are receptive to the fact that the people who are, in fact, controlling the capital market and the savings uh, of the capital market has to find a voice of explaining itself. The difficulty is, in fact, you say that, but uh, we need to be a little bit uh, missionary in uh, keep convincing those investors to, to understand that because, you know, at five o'clock you have to shut down the office and uh, uh, why to, to do so much? Uh, it's a bit costly. Uh, we already have in Switzerland Minder, you know, that's an initiative which force pension funds to vote their shares, but uh, the parliament find a way to, in fact, avoid that uh, index fund and uh, 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 investment funds vote. So very good, we can save that. No way to vote. It's too cumbersome, and I do, we don't understand why. So I think uh, in that aspect, every, every day we need to, to, do, to, to find the, the courage to, to venture in that. And the foundation, uh, which is led by Regis and Doris, is leaving out of the management fee of the fund to make the engagement. So we have to be very careful as well in uh, hiring the proper resources, in, uh, in uh, finding a financial uh, equilibrium. It's a, it's, a social, it's, a, it's a social business, in fact. So uh, it's, it's quite a challenge, and we have a great project, and that's why tomorrow we'll, uh, the foundation will give uh, uh, the Ashoka Prize to Social Enterprise, because we believe that as an active shareholders, we need to help those big multinational to uh, bridge the gap with the social entrepreneur field. There are a lot of of reason to make those two worlds uh, knowing each other better. And we are militating for that. Companies are reacting very well. And as I told you, investors still accept family businesses, private money. But the classical institutions, insurance companies, they, they, they find it interesting, but uh, OK, it's not so appealing. So we need every day to keep our enthusiasm and to keep convincing. It's a day-to-day -day, uh, job which requires uh, some uh, Courage, I would Real say. Courage. Yeah. One. <clears throat> Beautiful word, you know, courage. In Spanish, we call it valor. valor. So valor means courage, but also means value. And, and I think it says something about, you know, what courage is. Uh, I've done some courageous things in my life, I guess. When I was 23 years old, I, I, I was going around the world with the Minister of Finance negotiating uh, free trade agreements for Chile. That is something that you could say, oh, was courageous. <laughs> um, I've, um, I, every time that I have to drop some not so good news for investors, for example, about their beautiful projects, that requires a bit of uh, courage. Uh, partnering with my good friend, uh, with, with my good indigenous friend, Andres, is, has been courageous. I mean, uh, first going out of my... Uh, very well protected, privileged zone in Chile, and partnering with this guy that in Chile, because we discriminate these people, we think that these people, because they look different, they speak different, they're not worth of being a business partner. So I partnered with him because I value him as a human being. Uh, so I've done some, 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 some chasing my wife was another big thing. You know, I, I mean, every time that I, that, that I have, we have decided to have a new kid, Again, Kuar. So, but, 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 but for sure, uh, I think the most courageous thing I think I've done in my life is that when I decided that I had to go inside myself to see what was there. And that took me a long time to make that decision because that I was 
afraid of that. I was afraid of that. I got the intuition that there was something there that could be a good thing for my business and for my life. But I didn't want to go there. I was afraid of going there. Honestly, that was probably the most courageous thing I've done in my life. So I met this wonderful guy who is my coach until now, like some time ago. And we went, we started this process of slowly going inside me to looking for those good things and to looking for those not so good things. And, uh, and I found a wonderful world inside me. And again, that is, that is where the whole love from my mother comes, the thirst for justice from my father, my brothers and sisters, my wonderful friends in my life, my experiences in all cities of the world, etc., etc. So there's where I found that. So again, going, diving into that sea, that dark sea full of uncertainty, made me, I panicked before going inside me. I really panicked. I had to be extremely courageous for that. And I did it. And it proved to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Excellent. So I'm going to now take us into a, a, a place less comfortable, less familiar, certainly very uncertain, uh, sometime into the future. The year is 2030. So we have moved on. The global agenda has moved on. Um, you could make your own assumptions about what the world looks like in 2030. This is a bit of a scenario uh, you know, exercise. I'm going to ask each one of you to play a different role. And I'm going to assign that role as a professor. You know, I get to do this, give you all a very high grade at the beginning. But um, let's start over here on, on, on the right uh, with, with Hubert. You, in 2030, have been acquired by one of the world's Fortune 50 companies. Your company was so attractive that they wanted to have your company. <coughs> but the big surprise was they wanted you as the CEO. So congratulations. <laughs> so the question for you I have is, how do you convince the world's largest companies now, in the year 2030, as one of them, as the CEO of one of the top 20, 30 companies, oh. to be responsible leaders? Maybe I'm not sure it's such a good news. I would prefer the reverse <laughs> <to> say that. <laughs> but anyway. Um, well, I, I believe in 2030 the, the world will be different, of course. And uh, somehow we as middle stand industrial company, we are preparing, uh, preparing us for that. Um, we, we, we run a, um, uh, an internal workshop on what is really our know-how. And we find out that our know-how is not to manufacture printing consumables for barcodes or for... Uh, for printing. Uh, we have a special know-how if coating, in coating very thin, ultra thin films, because we, we coat films which, which with are uh, one twentieth of, uh, of um, hair. Uh, we put zero, zero, point, uh, uh, zero dot one gram to one gram of ink per square meter and all that at 500 mit meter per minute. So it's, it requires a lot of mastering technology. We found out that this know-how is very suitable for preparing the third generation of photovoltaic films. You know, today we have the third generation for the photovoltaic panels and so on. We begin to see some flexible and thin films which are made with, um, with uh, rare metals like silicium, gallium, indium, and so on and so on. But as we decided to put uh, sustainable development at the heart of our strategy, we said this is not the way. We will prepare the third generation, which component will be only, uh, only organic, not, no metal, no rare metals. And so we, we prepare a business. This is, you understand now why I wanted long-term investors and not short-term ones. We, we invest a lot on, in R&D to prepare flexible and thin films, which tomorrow will change a lot. You know, uh, we, can, we will be able to cover tents, we'll be able to cover stores, we'll be able to cover, uh, uh, you know, uh, the towns will be totally different, we'll be able to deliver light just through the, the films in the, in the bus uh, coverage or parking coverage or um, actually we'll be able to give access to many people 
um, to, 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 be, to be access to the energy to many people. We are, we are the art of the third revolution where uh, you know, the, the, the sun and the light are for everybody. And actually, it's, a, it's, it's, quite, it's quite, quite strange that we need to buy this, this light, which is given freely to everybody with the sun. So we need to reinvent the system. And in the same sense, we also we discover that our thin film can, uh, can change totally, improve the performance of electrical batteries, because with a thin film, we can, uh, we can reduce the size of, uh, of the collecting you know, films that are inside the batteries and so on. So in 2030, I think this industrial group, which is born in, two, in 1922 as a first carbon paper industrial company, now making printing consumable for barcodes, I think will be, and it aims to be a leader in the sustainable energies industry. And we are preparing it for that, for this mutation, you know. And the vision is that the world will need uh, uh, more clean energy and will need to preserve its natural resources. And we need to be prepared for that as industrial to, to, to save the world. The year is 2030. You have just been elected the first female, Asian female, vice president of the United States, since you said you can't be president, because there's a question about the country of origin. So you're vice president <laughs> of the United States. And the question I have for you, given the year 2030 and the pivot to the Pacific, to Asia, and the fact that you are an Asian American, how do we get in, by 2030 or in 2030, the Asian countries, you know them well, particularly China, on the same wavelength, thinking about the common good? You know, that's going to be incredibly challenging because of the cultural differences. My father always said that, you know, the East and the West, we just think in opposites. Even in our books, you know, in the East, we read our books left to right. Our pages turn left to right. But in the West, it's right to left. And so um, I think that, you know, if I were in this role where I'm representing the United States, diplomacy and international friendships is going to be very important. I think that one way um, to have someone else care about what you care about. And in this case, it's about advancing human life and the common good. You do that through relationships. Um, and it's through you know, diplomatic relationships. But beyond that, the personal relationship. Um, a lot of, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but like specifically in China, you know, they have voided their country of religion. And in a lot of instances, um, it's hard to see the effects of that. But I think by 2030, we'll, we'll understand the effects of that. Because when you um, eliminate, when you make humans um, the highest judge in chief, instead of um, you know, a third party who is objective or maybe more all powerful, then you, your value for the human life degrades. And we see that already where around the world um, business practices of some Asian companies are, are abhorrent because they, they treat people according to their social, economic, and ethnic heritage. So for example, if you're um, maybe Korean and you employ Cambodians, from an Asian perspective, a Cambodian is not as important as a Korean. And every Asian will say that they are the like, best Asian. But that's, that's the problem, is like when the core of your identity, because of your culture, is more nationalistic than thinking of the human person in a, from a global perspective, that's when you start seeing those tensions and arise. And so if I were to be the next vice president, I think it'd be very important to focus heavily on developing personal relationships with the leaders of these countries and hoping to change their perspective. So I'm turning to this side with some difficult questions. Uh, Melchior, the year is 2030. We almost fell into the abyss in 2008. In the year 2020, we did fall into the abyss. So we're coming out of the deepest world recession now in the year 2030. What lessons have the capital markets learned now that you as a Swiss, 
And this is the first time uh, you as a Swiss have been made the head of the IMF. I, uh, la, la, la. I, you know, in, in 2030, I will be 70, so I will not Such accept a young the man. job. <laughs> no, but we're living to 120. No, no, I know, I know, but I have other plans, you know, maybe like uh, becoming an hermit, uh, you know, in the Alps uh, at 70, I would say so. But I would accept to be an advisor, okay. special advisor to yeah. the IMF. Yeah. No, uh, I will tell you, if, we, if your scenario is right, my personal belief is... It, the, it will have happened because um, European integration would have failed. I'm strongly, I strongly believe, as a Swiss, that uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, political um, experience now, precisely now, uh, for the next five years, is European integration. Think about it, 500 million consumers linked by common understanding of human rights, freedom, uh, um, Christian value, but global values, uh, able to uh, attract new post-Sovietic countries within this dream instead of invading them to create an empire. So it's a completely new uh, political dynamic. No other experience like that except Switzerland, which did the same, attracting countries wanting to remain free from imperialism. Remember in the mid, uh, mid, Middle Age, Switzerland says no to the Habsburg. Sorry for, uh, sorry for uh, the archiduke who's uh, in the room, I see. <laughs> we say no to the empire. We say no to the uh, creation of uh, nation states. And now the nation states have ended up their uh, period, that they are still grasping uh, leaders, nation states leaders in Europe are still grasping into their sovereignty, their power, you know, by fear of just letting the region, letting the people freeing themselves. So uh, there is a lot of risk due to that, due to the fear, you know, of the uh, Council of States to uh, give more power to uh, the parliament, to uh, let create, uh, let uh, negotiate a new treaty, and I think if we fail, the world state will be uh, very fragile and very um, uh, volatile with a lot of risk. Um, I, give you, I give you an example. I've got a friend who's working for uh, uh, an NGO in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Caritas, in fact. So he's, he's, uh, he's uh, raising funds from some specific project. So he's going to countries, one country af after another, asking the, the uh, debts are in burn, or some uh, uh, Asian countries, development banks uh, for, for some money. When European countries are interested to the subject, they say, okay, we'll give you 10 million, but we need some uh, structural reform in terms of uh, justice, uh, democracy in the country to, to, uh, to, uh, to do that grant, some guarantee at least. But sorry, the Chinese and the Indian are never asking that. They are just saying, okay, let's have maybe a, a free access to the port or to some uh, export-import facilities. So without a strong Europe in the middle of this new globalization, uh, we might really have, uh, we might really end in 2030 uh, uh, out of a great recession. So my proposal as a, a special advisor to the head of IMF <laughs> would be to uh, really create a great co global coalition to really speed up the European integration because uh, that will maybe save the state of the world after that. So on the end, one, it's 2030. Your program in Chile has been demonstrably so effective, so novel, that you are now the president of the Inter-American Development Bank. How will you exercise those same regimens for a whole hemisphere? Hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 I don't know, but probably it would be following the same approach I, I, I follow now. You know, I, 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 uh, year after year, I, I, I prove to myself that, that this approach is kind of I don't know. It's, it's so effective, so efficient, uh, because it's where you are. So basically, I've, I've, 
I've, I've assumed different challenges and tasks in my life. And I think I found the, the formula for, 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 uh, for, uh, for them. And I, I'm not sure how is, how is the future. I, I've learned to, I, I feel comfortable living in uncertainty. I, my background is in uncertainty and risk. I like uncertainty. I, I, I spend some <laughs> fairly you know, decent time trying to model that damn thing. And, and, and at the end, I, I live comfortable with the, uh, among certainty. So the future is there. Uh, I think I found my own formula, which is being who I am with all what means, you know, all the, all the dark areas of myself and, and the bright, shining areas of myself. And if I'm the, I, I, there, was a, there was a time, a point in my life where I, where, where I envisioned to be a president of my country. And, um, and if I was a president, or, or they, 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 you know, in any position that I could assume, I, I, I would make my best to be the same who, are, who I am now and, and being truthful to who I am, basically. I, 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 yeah. Yeah. So we have people in the audience, any one of whom, frankly, could be on this panel. Let's be honest. We each have our own stories. We each have our own human persons, our connectedness, our profiles and courage. So I want each of the panelists, this is a different assignment, to ask a question that is really plaguing, bothering you, that maybe you can answer, maybe you can only partially answer, but to pose it, if you will, to the audience so that we can continue this conversation, in fact, indefinitely or into the future, certainly while we're here for a few days. What question would you pose for them? Well, <clears throat> I believe at this stage of my life that a problem we are facing as industrial companies, economical companies, is a very high return requirements from the finance uh, that is partly penalizing the job creation. Um, when I hear that a fund cannot be sustained below 17, 20% interest rate of return when the, the saving interest rate are maybe less than 2%, I have many questions behind that. And when I hear many times that um, the answer I get is, you know, you, you cannot do anything about it because this is a market. Um, my question is, could, shouldn't we set up a new standard? You know, if, if we would say uh, interest rate of return shall be 12%, it would change, it's, it's still a lot, but it would maybe change a lot the approach to the economy and uh, to face the main challenge today that is a job creation, in Europe at least. Uh, so I return the question, do you think this is feasible? Do you think this is the right way or not? Or Shall we maintain and go on maintaining that the return of funds shall be higher than that? What question would you pose? I think the question um, that I have for the audience, and hopefully that we'll be able to discuss this week, is can you imagine a world where um, we have a financial system where no matter you know, how poor or how little assets you have that you can be a part of? So if, even if you're like a widowed, um, you know, single mom living in a hut in the middle of Mozambique, can you still have access to sell your goods, to receive money, to send money, you know, into the main city to pay for your son's school? Like how, what would that look like? And um, could we somehow influence and lead businesses to think of a different sort of bottom line, one that is invested in enriching people's lives and not, not just padding our own pockets. So that's the question that I would have. Turning to this side now, being provocative and bold, I don't want easy questions for this audience. What would you ask them? Uh, I would like to ask um, the question of about European integration, in fact, because personally I think that if you, if you try to, to prioritize the issue of humanizing globalization, the first priority is to succeed within the next five years, a new step in European integration. Personally, I feel it like a huge risk to fail that historic opportunity. We, we, we quite destroyed the, the, the work of 50 years of uh, European uh, uh, builders. 
uh, and um, the raise of uh, sovere sovereignist party in the parliament, the unemployment, um, the undemocratic role of the BCE somehow, um, I think is a, it, is it put, put the globalization at, at, at risk. And, and I would ask the question, especially to Christopher, maybe how, how Dermat could help uh, speeding up the process, making the people more aware of that priority, because you have the tree and the forest, but the forest is succeeding <laughs> the uh, next step. So that's my question. Juan, do you have a hard question for this audience? <clears throat> it is a hard one. Yeah. So I, I would ask to each one of you, that have you put enough time in getting to know how beautiful you are? <laughs> what is that capital you can bring to your business? Courage is a big task. So, so now comes the time. We're very close to the time, Christopher, when for uh, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, if you behaved, uh, no speeches, no PowerPoint slides, no long comments, direct questions to the panel, to individuals on the panel, from the audience. So your participation is encouraged. Are we ready? Just signal yourself, a wave of the hand. Uh, yeah, we have people with microphones in the audience. Here we go. Hi, my name is Matthias. I'm a physician and microbrewer. And uh, my question comes back to a conversation we had yesterday uh, with uh, Christopher and Arnaud Moreau. I mean, we realize humanizing, humanizing globalization uh, requires an inclusive mindset. However, we're not living in a perfect world. and uh, the shared concern we had yesterday is that we're facing a lot of uh, xenophobia and if I say xenophobia that is less about geographic or political uh, boundaries it's more about uh, gender it's about religion it's about cultural language differences and uh, the question to the panel is I mean how do you think we can overcome xenophobia or the xenophobic mindset that currently is evolving in uh, a number of countries, also in Europe. So does anyone want that question? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I would say it's, uh, first of all, going out of your comfort zone. I mean, our company is made of that richness of different cultures. We, uh, <clears throat> if we're going, if, if, we're, if uh, a basic business uh, advantage of, of our model is that, is that we know better than anybody else the communities is because we employ people from the communities. In this case, indigenous people. That is not easy because, again, they look different. When I went to school, they never taught me who, who those people were. In fact, they taught me that those people were not so good. They were lazy. They were drunk, etc., etc., right? And now I've, I've found a partner and also wonderful employees. So, but I had to go out of my comfort zone. I, I, I had to decontract a bit what I learned. That's my personal experience. I'm convinced we need um, each one of us to, to set up examples of friendship with different persons. For instance, you know, one of my associates is, is Muslim. Um, uh, leading all the controlling of the company and I learned so much from him from his integrity, his, his honesty and I think we behave as brothers I'm Catholic, he's Muslim he, he celebrates, when there, are, there is Catholic feast he, say, he sends me good feast you bear. and I do the same for him and I think it's setting up friendship he's, ab he's able to show that we can be different each one faithful to our belief but together one of my colleagues at Yale, Miroslav Wolf, who's actually a Croatian, wrote a book recently on Islam, where he calls all the people of the world not simply to tolerate each other, which of course we have done in civilized societies, more or less, for 100, 150 years, not just to respect the other, which is absolutely required, 
but to go one step further and to actually honor the other. Honoring the other, putting yourself in their position, in their shoes, not to have a feeling of superiority, absolutely required. It's, um, it's true that it's so much harder to vilify someone when you actually know them. But when you don't, it's so easy to say negative things and put them down, but if you actually have a relationship with someone, so encouraging the diversity of, of cultures and religion and thought in um, each of our business practices, I think, is one step towards achieving that goal. Do we have another question? Yeah, we have a question here. Hi. Marcello Palazzi, I think, is a great panel. Thank you. One quick question is, um, would any one of you want to share a moment where you didn't have the courage to act? Mm. And mm. what... Because that, that, that is something that is my experience that actually mm. if I look back, it's been those moments when I hadn't had the courage to act that have been most learning for me. Mm -hmm. And so what, what has that done to you in terms of actually uh, you know, why you didn't have the courage to act and, and what is uh, the implication for future actions? Thank you. True confessions now. That's a more difficult question. And actually, you know, writing case studies about companies that have failed is, is more difficult, but there, there are profound lessons to learn. Anyone want to take up a, a comment on uncarriage? Uh, maybe not really significant, but it's a personal Try. <laughs> so when I was passing my maturity. Uh, I, uh, as, as I told you, I, I'm fascinated by uh, horseshoe jumping. And I, I, I had the courage to write a letter to one of my heroes saying uh, that I wrote his book and that I would like to meet him once I was 18. And he answered to me, inviting me to a stage, a training program, uh, a great guy called Jean Dorgex. Maybe some of you know him, Chevalier Jean Dorgex, a really incredible guy. He's, he's, he passed away now. And uh, uh, after the stage, I, I received a call of his uh, impresario who asked me to join in to become one of the écuyer um, um, or a rider for the new school he wanted to launch. And I had my maturity in front of me, and I, somehow I was too serious, and I said no. And I, I, and I always regret it. After five years, he stopped the school, in fact. But uh, I, I don't know what, how would have been my life if I have said yes. And I uh, somehow every day, uh, very often I, I always saying I was not brave enough to accept these uh, uh, proposal. So. Hmm. It's a difficult question, but I think for me at least it's, I don't know if I can say moments where I didn't have, but I see many moments where I doubt I have the courage. Uh, in the sense that when you have deep conviction for instance to respect human beings, at the same time you have economical constraints, for instance, shall you close an industrial site or not? And despite you want to save jobs, sometimes you have to do it, for instance. Um, and in, in many times, well, the, the frontier between what I can call discernment, time of discernment, and maybe acting too late is not easy. Mm -hmm. Hmm? And um, if, especially if you, you want always to give a chance, to, to people and to business, maybe after some years, maybe in some cases, I said maybe I should have acted quicker. But at the time I did it, I thought it was good to give a chance. So this is a, actually I didn't, I, I don't have the answer to this question. I mean, between uh, being sharp in acting quickly and giving time to discernment, it's not always easy. Is there another question? Marta Drummond, it's not actually a question, but it's a quote from Mahatma Gandhi that I thought was particularly apposite, and in light of the fact we're running out of time, I wanted to share it with you. If I believe, uh, if I have the belief that I can do it, I shall surely acquire the capacity to do it, even if I may not have it at the beginning. And I think that every member of the panel has demonstrated their courage and their capacity to um, believe in themselves and what is really important. Thank you very much. It's been an outstanding panel. So here, here's how we're going to wrap up what has been a good conversation, but one that should continue uh, into, well into the break. 
Uh, I would like to take uh, one minute, two minutes from each of the panelists here in, in the wrap up to, uh, to do something that Peter Drucker, the famous guru, really the father of management science, started a long time ago. I once did a series of conferences with him at the Aspen Institute where we had the social sector meeting with the private sector. And it was like two ships passing in the ninth. I mean, <laughs> but at the end of each session, the very profound Peter Drucker was asked to say what I heard. And the room would go deathly silent. And everyone would wait to hear what Peter Drucker heard. So I'm going to ask each one of you, maybe starting on this side first, because I've been unfair on this side here, <laughs> and ask Juan first, what did you hear that was particularly insightful in our conversation this morning? What can people take away? in a minute. Hmm. <clears throat> I would bet that, uh, that every one of you is, is, is a wonderful human being, really. I, I, I truly believe it, because uh, in my not so long life, I've met way more wonderful people than not so wonderful people. So take the courage somewhere and, 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 and dive into yourself, because uh, the riches is there. Uh, run your businesses or your initiatives, your ventures, your whatever, based on that, you won't fail there. That, 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 that's what I'm taking from, 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 from here. So what I will keep and, and uh, teach to my children, I think, because I, I love the story, I think, I, I don't remember who said that, maybe you, Hubert, which is uh, don't run after money, let, let money chasing you. So inspire, that was you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So inspired people, people are uh, tr uh, finding their inner truth, you know, and knowing what they have to do in whatever industry, uh, cultural activity will succeed. Uh, so I, I think that's the major takeaway for me, at least. Thank you. Turning to this side, Chignon. I think the major takeaway is, and I feel like this is a group that is already there, um, but understanding who you are, so what is your identity, and what is your specific role to play in this world. You know, obviously each one of us, where we alone can't change the world, we can't change the way that people perceive the human person and how they do their businesses, but collectively, as a group, we have the power to influence, we have the power to affect change. Um, and that can only be effective if we, individu as individuals, know who we are, um, what is our purpose in life, and what is the role that we have been put on earth to play? Yeah. Well, w what I get from this uh, panel is uh, the commitment of each one here uh, with truth and freedom, being true with ourselves, with, uh, with uh, deep convictions, mm -hmm. and to be free to renounce, because courage requires renouncing also to other things. And when you said, you said that well, you could have been a big man manager of a big investment firm and so on. I'm sure you can. You, you have been very successful, but you renounce to it for something more deep, deeper. And um, this is very impressive. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the panel. I'd, I would like to close as well with some quotes, because we have a minute. And I looked these up uh, just before coming here. <coughs> so I have just a few short quotes, but they're profound. Listen to them. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. Steve Jobs, the, the late Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Second, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Nelson Mandela. Courage is not what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Winston Churchill. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. <laughs> T.S. Eliot. And finally, and I think most importantly, in conclusion, 
Courage is the most important of all the virtues. Because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. Maya Angelou, who recently passed. So, I don't know if you feel the same way, but would you stand and give this panel a, a, a round of applause? <laughs>